Do you enjoy politics? It's not a great opening question, I agree, for an online worship, but it's pertinent, I feel. You might have seen or heard Prime Minister's questions, or how not to answer any questions, but they give you a particular relevant soundbite, and it goes on. It can be a lot worse than that. We have politicians who use their position to make swathing statements about groups of individuals, causing them even more fear for their lives. And they, if they can be, they get even more alienated. This is Sanctuary Sunday, a day when we, as the church, pause to consider those who seek sanctuary with us, among us. Do we join in with the negative comments, enjoy playing the aggressor, the one on top, or do we identify with the marginalised? If we can do that, or even take the neutral point of view, watching the ensuing battle, can we identify with that? Today we'll be looking at some power battles from the viewing platform of one of the Gospels. Firstly, let's pray. Oh, now, if prayer isn't your thing, then consider it as an aspiration or a hope. Now in Scotland we may talk of, I'm off to get my messages. It's not the email or post, but it's our shopping. So to rattle down the shopping list and hope that we get it all done may be a tall order. If it's for me, anyway, I might get some additional hot cross buns, but no doubt I'll forget the eggs or something. Call it an age thing. Anyway, if we spoke with someone we loved and said, I need you to get this and that and that, we might get an interesting response. And I'm putting that politely. Perhaps God doesn't exist to answer our prayers, but prayer exists for us to know the mind of God. So when we pray, we might pause. We might allow all that's going on in the business of life to slow down and listen. Where can I be part of God's solution? Holy God, in all that has been going on in recent days and nights for some, life has been a bit hectic. We might have forgotten to speak with someone down the road, but also you. We give of this time, for starters, just to be with you, to rest with you and listen to you. Speak afresh, we pray. I'm seeking to listen. Okay, we're going to look at a particular passage from Matthew's Gospel. But hold on, just like when we receive an email, we need to know the context. Where are we in this conversation? Well, Jesus has sent out his chosen 12, his squad, with some detailed instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles, nor those Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel. Wow, that's quite restrictive. It's quite specific to those disciples, and perhaps we need to take stock of that. It was an instruction to them, and not us. It's odd, as Jesus would often go on a journey through Samaria or into the Gentile territory with the disciples. Perhaps the disciples could only handle a smaller, more local task. Oh, but by, by the way, there's trouble ahead as well. Jesus tells them a brother will betray his brother, a dad betray his child, a child will betray their parents, causing them to be killed. Notice the lack of women mentioned there. Women didn't have a power in law, didn't have a voice, so a woman raising her voice just wouldn't be heard. The culture of the day. Not today, surely? He advised his disciples not to take a tunic or staff for them. Why? Possibly because it was the symbol of the cynics, that's a group prevalent in the day, uh, who are particularly dog-like, because the word from the cynic, kinikos, actually means dog-like. It's where we get that word cynic. Given their numbers, it must have felt like going out as sheep into the midst of wolves, a bit like today, with falling numbers of those who identify as Christians. So today's passage could be summarised by Dear all, it's all going wrong for you. Hear this. Love Jesus. Do you feel it's a bit like that today for us? It's time to pause on what God is saying to us. Be still and know that I am God.
we read from Matthew 10, I'm going to read some verses in turn, verses 24 and 25. A student doesn't get a better desk than her teacher. A labourer doesn't make more money than his boss. Be content, pleased even, when you, my students, but my harvest hands get the same treatment I get. If they call me the master, dung face, what can the workers expect? What did you say? That's not very nice. So Matthew is initially seeking a level playing field. So why do people elevate others to such great heights? If we are ministering, serving all, there's little hierarchy to note. We are called to take the role of the guest rather than the host. Why does status matter so much? To be members of this household was to be known as with Jesus and some criticism might be expected, but don't face? In church, we have ministers, but they're only seeking to serve their churches where they are, in their communities. If they stand on a status, call them out. Verses 26 and 27. Don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. In Matthew's context, we've had the siege of Jerusalem and the Romans have crushed any rebellion. The religion of the Romans was paramount and the Jews are struggling. They certainly knew of outward pressure. The difficulties we might consider as Christians might be a lot different to them. Nonetheless, it's still very real. And as Methodists, with our focus upon social justice, we need to hear the voice of the marginalised. Matthew 10 verses 28 to 31. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body and soul in his hands. What's the price of a pet canary? Some loose change, right? And God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you, down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. The cynics of the time didn't have any fear of death, nor of gods. Jesus is emphasising that our whole self is important. Mind, body, spirit, soul. How can we kill the soul? That verse about canaries as well. In other Bibles, sparrows are mentioned. In Luke's Gospel, the going rate was five sparrows for two cents. You may think that's quite good. In Matthew, it's now two sparrows per cent. Sparrows were the food of the poor, but God values them as well as us, all of us. If we are all valued, let's hear about the politics of the world are currently decrying. The refugee is despised. But it is the fault of the people smuggler. Nevertheless, the target is the refugee, and it is they who are threatened with deportation. It's not illegal to seek asylum, and neither in the first country they arrive in. If that makes us react, then possibly we need to ask whether humanity, on the move because of war and famine, is worth more than the people fortunately to be born in our country. In the United States, an American pastor recently stated that all parents of transgender children should be shot. That was discerned to be biblical, and it certainly was a soundbite. Well, I wrote to him and I asked to discuss this. 
but haven't received any response. If 40% of transgender children are disowned by their parents, what influence has there been from society? Society has chosen to focus its ire towards the transgender, the non-binary, the queer community, as they don't seem to fit the stereotypical model of normality. It's not killing the person, it's removing them from the equation. Stand up for me against world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. If you turn tail and run, do you think I'll cover for you? That's powerful. Stand up for me against world opinion. This is about the justice of kind approach mentioned in 1 Samuel 2.30. Whatever we measure out to others will be measured out to you. Can we stand back and watch other groups, those we might not even identify with, being further marginalised? Or do we join in? with the popular voice. Don't think I've come to make life cosy. I've come to cut, make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law, cut through these cosy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be our worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer your son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. Jesus' language is provocative, but it is part of the way Jews would express something incredible in the negative. It got your attention, like a soundbite of today. Jesus speaks a lot about peace, and he's suddenly not going to act like a ninja with a knife flailing. He's emphasising that it isn't going to be a bowl of cherries. It's all about what makes us tick. In the recent studies of Revelation, it was whether they followed Caesar or Christ. In Matthew's day, it was to follow Jesus or a plethora of other gods that exist on the high street. The high street. It's not a problem that's changed with us, is it? Christ or the high street. Our attention is drawn in so many ways. So let's pause and focus on God with a hymn. Some music which allows us to pause and reflect on who is God. So we invite you to either listen or sing along. It's up to you. Longing for light, we wait in darkness.
So back to the high street. When we walk down there, imagine the online version of the high street isn't your thing. We can see the glitz, the offers. What do we see beyond the shop window? The offers are there to boost the company, the club cards some shops use, allow them to better understand who we are, what we like to buy, so they can help direct us to their next offer. The online algorithm defines what we see online as a way of controlling us, and we can become accustomed to that guidance. When do we take control? When do we seek to be alongside those who are hooked onto what they are being shown? We come now to a time of prayer, a prayer for others, again, to know the mind of God. Thank you, Mandy. Holy God, we pause to be with you. When we see the plight of the world, your world, we might come to a conclusion based upon our thoughts, our experience, and we listen to you now. When we speak of refugees from war-torn countries, for countries ravaged by famine, destroyed by earthquake. Where am I in your solution? When I reflect upon those who identify differently to me in terms of sex or gender, and it's so confusing. Where is love and respect, understanding? Where am I? in your solution. When I meet those who appear different to me, immigrants who are now integrated within our country, our country, how do you wish me to respond? Where am I in your solution? And I pause to hear you with all of the burdens upon my heart this day. For the local community, for my family and myself, I bring these to you as we continue to dialogue. Amen. As we continue in prayer, we wonder, for us as church, is it the prosperity gospel we seek? or the gospel of comfort, or the gospel that we are right. We can emphasise that the building is so important, but it, as it defines our church, when the church first identified in Acts chapter 9 in Antioch was a rich mixture of synagogues and houses, it was the people. What if the image we portrayed was of a community that loved others, spoke up for others? This is counter to the business model of today. We seek stability when the followers of Jesus sought radical change. What might we look like if we were to redraw church using this model? Why not write your thoughts in the comments below or give us a ring? We close our service with this beautiful hymn, Will You Come and Follow Me If I But Call Your Name? my name
And a blessing. May our loving God speak afresh with us so we may grow to know the mind of God. Jesus, speak about how we can love all whom we meet, all whom we meet. And Spirit, strengthen us in times of weakness. Amen. <laughs>